episode seven of Eye on Horror. I'm your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is your host, Jacob Davison. How you doing? Doing good and happy to be here yet again. And also, our road warrior, for a couple of days, he's home in Los Angeles, Jonathan Korea. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, really happy to be back home in uh, L.A., even if it's only for a couple of days before I head out to Vegas tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> the next couple of podcasts you'll probably be doing from sin city since you're going to be there for the better part of june right that is true yeah i'll be there for a few weeks so if anyone has any good um you know vegas horror films that isn't you know leprechaun 3 which i've already seen <laughs> uh let me know send your suggestions and uh weird places to uh visit because i love visiting weird places does con air count as a <laughs> horror film <laughs> a little bit <laughs> it has a hannibal lecter guy in it Played by Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Ooh. And Cyrus the Virus. Yes. I mean, any opportunity to talk about Con Air is time well spent. You know, I, I don't believe in guilty pleasures because I don't feel guilty about anything. <laughs> but Con Air, Roadhouse, Face Off, these are movies that other people might be ashamed that they love. <laughs> why are you just listing off some of my favorite movies? Like, why you gotta why you got to do that? Try to bring <laughs> shame to Roadhouse. That's... <laughs> It's not a thing. Uh, that's why we're pals. <laughs> we, there's the triple feature right there. Actually, I think we've discussed this before. Who had a better 1997 than Nicolas Cage between Con Air and Face Off? I don't know. In 1997, I was a kid and I did get a copy of Lost World Jurassic Park on VHS. So my year was pretty, <laughs> was pretty stacked. I will say that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, and I just celebrated my birthday last week, and I did it in the most uh, horror fan way possible. Uh, the American Cinema Tech at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood was hosting a Texas Chainsaw triple feature and barbecue for Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and barbecue. Yeah, they, they had a, a burnt to a crisp uh, Texas barbecue food truck there, and they had a screening of the first three uh, Texas Chainsaw movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1, Part 2, and Leatherface, and they even brought in a bunch of uh, props and stuff, and Caroline Williams is there. Yeah, just couldn't think of a much better way to celebrate my birthday than that. And yeah, that's that's great. So, how w w you're you're 18 now, right? You're going to be able to vote in the midterms. You know, is uh, that <laughs> oh yeah, that's today. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what we're supposed to do today, right? No, it's tomorrow. We are recording this on uh, Monday, June 4th. Oh yeah, you're right. That's tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow is our uh, is our midterms. Yeah, okay. go out and vote. Go out and vote. Yes, vote or I don't die. Care who you vote for. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if any, if the last year and a half has taught us anything, it's uh, make your voice heard, because if you don't, the minority wins and you might not like what the minority is doing. And we're not going to get political. Yeah. But no, we're not here to get political unless we're talking about the movie <laughs> Uncle Sam. <laughs> yes. Or Death Dream. Ooh, or what was the what was the one David Arquette made? You know, the, uh, the, with the Nixon mask. Oh, uh, the Tripper. The tripper. Or, or, or no, no way. That was no way. That was Ronald Reagan. Oh, that was although a Reagan the, mask. The, the one, although the oh. one with the Nixon mask was Horror House on Highway Five. There we go. <laughs> I'm getting my I'm getting my president's mask. I'm surprised I didn't say what was the one with the with the guys. They all wore president's masks and Keanu Reeves shot a gun. And, <laughs> oh, what was that horror movie? Point Break. Oh, Point Break. Yes, terrifying movie. One of my favorite mask gags, and this is this is tangentially horror, was from Baby Driver when yes. they're pulling a heist, and he's like, "Get us Michael Myers." masks this is a mike myers mask no the halloween mask this is a halloween mask <laughs> i love what that bit. disconnect all right let's uh let's get to some news what has happened just this morning there was some exciting news oh yeah yeah the uh new suspiria trailer uh, or it was the first one i think they released a couple of teasers but this is like the first biggest full one. yeah we got of it and first real trailer yeah yeah and uh I, I must say, you know, Suspiria is one of those movies. It's known for uh, its very colorful palette. It's very visually beautiful uh, on its score. And this trailer showcases one thing. I know, James, you were saying that you love the score, but yeah, what were your opinions on that? It's pretty much what I was expecting from a Suspiria remake from the guy who did Call Me By Your Name. And here's the thing. I usually avoid trailers, but I watched this one because I figured we were going to want to talk about it here. <laughs> so I, I actually did watch it. It's pretty much what I expected visually. I mean, I love Dakota Johnson, so I'm I'm kind of excited for that. Um, but 
as far as the music and, you know, and I asked Jacob before we started rolling to because if, if he recognized the music or is that actual score, because if it's the actual score, they're knocking out of the park because, you know, because it's, I love the score. I mean, that, that little two minute trailer, I mean, Hey, that'll be score of the year for me. You know, yeah. it, it'll, it'll, it'll knock you were never really here out of my number one spot for score <laughs> just on that alone. The thing yeah. that really grabbed me, uh, aside from the music was, uh, the use of colors because uh, Suspiria, uh, you know, what made it so infamous was just the use of, uh, color gels and making things all, uh, fantastical. And this time, uh, fi- I think the primary color is is kind of that weird drab green. It's, yeah. It popped up in, in, in a lot of the scenes. And uh, and also, I really like how they shot the trailer. It's kind of a montage, so it just kind of overwhelms you with all this bizarre and vaguely threatening imagery. And uh, speaking of vaguely threatening, Tilda Swinton, right? Yes. yes. Til- She's in it, yeah. As a friend of mine said, forever the woman smoking a cigarette. Yes. <laughs> I will say this. I'm kind of glad just from what we're seeing, what we're shown at least and it's not a lot that because again Suspiria is so full of color um, that this one almost looks like they're it's like pulled out like it's much more as you said drab much more dark much more um, void of this color so it, yeah. at least it looks like uh, the filmmakers are trying to separate themselves from Suspiria the original and trying to do their own spin on it so, and I like that I want uh, if someone's going to remake something you got to do something different with it yeah uh, imagine if John Carpenter just remade the thing from outer space as is. You know, we wouldn't yeah. have. If you don't put your own spin on it, you end up with Gus Van Zandt's Psycho. <laughs> <clears throat> and don't get me started on Gus Van Zandt's Psycho. <laughs> okay, we won't. We won't. We're going to have a Psycho episode and we're going to talk about all the Psycho movies because I will gladly not defend Gus Van Zandt's Psycho, but I will. I, I'll have points. <laughs> all right. <laughs> points well, we'll save around. it for another time. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Also, in terms of news and going back on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Scream Factory uh, made a uh, bombshell of <laughs> announcement today saying that they're releasing a collector's edition version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Famously starring <laughs> Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey. I hope that they get some special features from those two. Oh, I, doubt I wish. Have, have they come to terms with, with their cinematic history yet? Or no. <laughs> Are the Oscar winners too good for TCS? <laughs> yeah, like, didn't Renee <laughs> Zillweger want her name removed from the titles or something? They both I think did. they both did. Yeah. They both did. That's why if you look at the theatrical posters, they're not really using it. But once it went to video, their names were all over it because that's mm-hmm. where, like, I think the court settled. Like, they couldn't use yeah. their imagery or their uh, names for the theatrical release, but home video wasn't quite a thing yet. So, yeah. Uh, There's that's, a loophole. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. the loophole they went with, but... No, looking at the artwork, it's the same guy who did um, uh, the Silent Night, Deadly Night, Serpent in the Rainbow, and the new Ninja 3 uh, collector's edition that's coming out soon. Uh, it actually looks pretty good. Um, sometimes Screen Factory collector's edition's cover art can be hit or miss with me, but I kind of dig it. Looks interesting. Yeah. And, you know, I've actually never seen this one. It's one of the few Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies I've never seen, uh, mainly due to the infamy. And it just it just sounds sounded like one of the weirdest of them all, and uh, and part two is my favorite, so I, I don't know what to think. Well, how could you not love part two? It opens up with uh, <laughs> Leatherface on top of a or popping out of a van, Eating I believe, truck. and, and uh, they're blasting Oingo Boingo's "Nothing Lives Forever" as he's like the biggest chainsaw ever at a y- couple of yuppies in a and using a corpse as a human shield. <laughs> <laughs> So good, ah. yeah. But um, yeah, have either of you seen Next Generation? Uh, no, very long time ago, and I remember it being pretty stupid. <laughs> um, but I haven't seen. I mean, hey, Screen Factory will get a rewatch out of me, I'm sure. So, oh yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it a look. But yeah, I mean, I, I have not seen it in years and years. As an avid collector of their collector's edition, it's going to be on my shelf no matter the quality. So, <laughs> I got to say, I'm a sucker for their slip covers. So. Uh, do you have Gus Van Zant's Psycho? I I do own that. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to if you want to start that up again, yes, I do own the Psycho. No, I was just curious. <laughs> Speaking of slipcovers, uh, John, I do want to talk to you about uh, when it comes to collecting, just like it, it just the generality of uh, mm-hmm. slipcovers and like what it adds and what it doesn't. Yeah. Because I, I don't know. In general, my thoughts are I like having my own video library and I like the slipcovers because. 
you know it feels like uh, having a having a book cover you know it's it, it just adds to the library yeah and for me i mean i'm a big collector uh that's where majority of my income goes when it's not you know after rent electricity all my general bills i guess food too you should probably buy some <laughs> food um but yeah i mean i have over 1600 movies on blu-ray alone Damn. And, um, for me, when it comes to slip covers, it's one of those things where it's like, don't really care if it's like, you know, uh, like a big budget thing. You know, like I don't need an exclusive slip cover for Super Troopers or something like that. But um, for some of them, like what drew me to collect, you know, all the collector's editions of Scream Factory and other boutique uh, places like that, like uh, Vinegar uh, Syndrome does really good slip covers, is that they always have alternative artwork on the inside. And so I mm-hmm. like that because. Um, a lot of times I think it's really cool to have like this new artwork and then you open it up and there's the, the original theatrical. So for me, it does that. Um, also, and this is going to hurt a lot of people, the resale value uh, goes up a lot when you uh, still have them. So I figure, you know, plus it looks really nice when you have all of your uh, one collections just all look the same, all have like the same layout. Looks nice. I will admit one of my um, pet peeves in my collection right now is not having the slipcover for Purge Anarchy because I have the one for the first and the third. And it's just like really irking me to the point where I'm like, (laughs) do I really want to spend like eight or ten bucks on like another copy of it just to have this piece of cardboard? But I as far as slipcovers go for me, I, I going back to what you said, the different artwork, I got that that waxwork double set from uh, Vestron. Oh, yeah. Um, I, got it, I got it from Amazon, and the one they sent me didn't have a slip cover, so the cover looks like it's just the first movie. And um, oh. and I actually I actually sent it back. I made them send me another one that does have a slip cover because the slip cover actually says it's waxwork one and two. And when you open the, the case, you can reverse the cover art to be waxwork two. Right. But yeah, it, it bothered me so much I had them send me another one yeah. <laughs> because I was, cause I was so bummed that I'm, I'm like, if I put this on my shelf i'm gonna forget that i have waxwork too. i'm not really gonna forget that i have waxwork too but you know somebody looking through my stuff is gonna be like why don't you have waxwork too yeah uh, and just uh, just uh, an aside like i have to bring up that waxwork too is probably one of my all-time favorite lines you're in god's nintendo <laughs> <laughs> with a power glove or no power glove uh, no power glove damn then you're fucked <laughs> Um, I don't know, like with the slip covers, I mean, I definitely, if I can get one, it's cool, but if I can save money and, you know, I can go without it, like uh, the other day I was at Best Buy and they had uh, Land of the Dead on sale, but it didn't have the slip cover, but... You know, I've I've been really wanting that one for a while, and I don't know the yeah, and the slip cover is pretty cool, but like I didn't need it that bad. Right. One thing that really bums me out about slip covers, and and Scream Factory actually has found a way around this, um, is when you go to like someplace like Best Buy or Fry's, and they put the sticker on the slip cover, mm. es- especially fries. Cause you can't get those ones off. Best buys Yeesh. come off a little cleaner, yeah. but um, screen factory now shrink wraps the uh, slip cover with the actual disc. So if, you know, if best buy sticks the price sticker right on that, you know, it comes off with the shrink wrap. So they've found their way around it, but that, Oh, that it, I've actually, if I'm on the fence about a title and the uh, price sticker is on the slip cover, I've actually not bought it. <laughs> I've been like, Oh, nah, <laughs> well, and that, and that makes sense, especially with Scream Factory. I mean, um, that's a huge aftermarket right there for slipcovers. All the um, buy, sell, trade groups I'm on on Facebook and other sites, you know, when it comes to cult horror and all that, um, those slipcovers, there's people that are willing to shell out like 10 15 20 sometimes $30 even just, just for the cardboard. It's uh, it gets yeah. a little ridiculous. And I will admit, when I was – on my pursuit to complete my Scream Factory, because especially with Scream Factory, like I bought so many titles, I just went, well, I'm only like 10 off from having all of them, so might as well, you know. And Might as well go for Gus Van Zandt's Psycho. Oh, man, it was especially... <laughs> Is that the new Rampage? Is Gus Van Zandt's Psycho this week's oh, Rampage? God. <laughs> God damn it. Oh, we're um, going to have to do Psycho versus Rampage now. Oh, uh, Psycho versus we'll, Rampage. We'll do that episode I'd pay soon. money for that. <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, uh, the hardest title to find with its slipcover was Lake Placid. Like, even Life Force, really? which really? went out of print, 
uh, was easier. I had to shell out a few extra bucks for that one, but uh, seeing how that one was super out of print uh, with the special feature and the slipcover, it was worth the extra 10, 20 bucks. But um, no, uh, Lake Placid was the hardest, but it also had the easiest resolution to it because I searched, I, you know, Amoeba, searched online, searched everywhere, and I couldn't find it for less than 50, 60 bucks. And then, I, and then someone went, hey, I just bought one from BestBuy.com and it came with a slipcover. I went, fuck it, I'll take a chance. And I bought it on Best Buy. Sure enough, it came with a slipcover and it blew me away. I was like, holy shit, if I had just known about this a couple months ago, my collection would have been completed much sooner. I'm, I'm surprised that um, that Lake Placid was that out of print, honestly. I mean, I mean, I like it as a movie, but it doesn't seem like it's something like They Live or Life right. Force. You know, it doesn't seem like it has the cult following. Well, it was just um, the slipcover. Yeah, that was okay and then a lot of places just flat out weren't selling it um too i think it's because it wasn't as popular as the other ones um especially they may not have pressed as many of them yeah scream factory may not may have only pressed you know a few thousand instead of ten thousand right and i think that's one of the reasons why i was able to get it through best buy was just because it wasn't you know that much of a seller so they had a lot of back stock from those first three months of them producing it so yeah all i know is hey i got like placid and the slipcover was in decent shape so I'm happy. Uh, what are the news we got? Well, I will say, uh, seeing as how you brought up Rampage, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll never get through a recording without bringing up that masterpiece. Uh, but and here, why should we? Why should we? Um, exactly. <laughs> but Julian Dennison of uh, Hunt for Wilder People and Deadpool 2 fame uh, was just casted in um, Godzilla vs. Kong. And that just makes me extremely happy because we haven't really heard much about that film in a while. We know that Adam Wingard's directing it, which, you know, he made some pretty stellar movies in the past. So I'm excited to see what he can do with a good budget. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, we know very little except that at some point Godzilla is going to fight Kong, which uh, mm-hmm. is still intriguing because even in the new um, franchises, Godzilla is huge and Kong is pretty big for... You know, an oversized gorilla, but still, uh, yeah, he's he's dwarfed by Godzilla. Even 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 the overgrown Skull Island Kong. It'll be interesting to see how they put those together. Is Mike Doherty doing just a regular Godzilla movie? Then, yeah, it's uh, doing... Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yeah, okay, okay. And I think that comes out next year. Yeah. yeah, they're both coming up pretty soon. Yeah, when you said Wingard, I originally thought. I, I went to Mike Doherty, but um, yeah, I'm getting I'm getting my Godzilla. It, it's first world problems when you're having too many Godzilla movies coming out. I know, but sadly, no Shin Godzilla too. Instead, they're focusing on making their own uh, Godzilla multiverse. So we won't get a yeah. sequel to that. But I mean, we're getting Godzilla movies left and right, or I should say, east and west. Uh, <laughs> Millie Bobby Brown is also casting yes. King Kong versus Godzilla. Oh yeah, yes. 11. And I think a lot of the uh, people in King of the Monsters are coming back for uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, it sounds like. So it looks like mm. King of the Monsters is setting up for uh, not only an epic fight, because uh, I think Jacob knows more about this than I do, an epic battle between, who is it, King, King Ghidorah and... Mothra. And Mothra. And Rodan. And Rodan. Looks like it's going to be the uh, traditional uh, Godzilla versus uh, King Ghidorah set, because they were also in the original King Kong versus Godzilla. Or, sorry, the original Godzilla versus King Ghidorah. I got my kings mixed up. Yeah. Are Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson coming back? Because they were in the post credit uh-huh. scene that kind of explained where they're going with King Ghidorah Mothra and Rodan. Um, haven't heard anything about that, but uh, I'm looking up the IMDb page, and yeah, oh yeah, so Millie Bobby Brown is going to be in uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters first, and yeah, she's also going to be in uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, and let's see, we're also, uh, other people include uh, Sally Hawkins, uh, Kyle Ooh. Chandler. I was about to say, isn't Friday Night Lights going to be in it? And Thomas Middleditch, Silicon Valley. Okay, so one Thomas for another. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, Charles Dance from Game of Thrones. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. If if Sally Hawkins isn't careful, she's going to get a reputation as a monster actress. <laughs> because of the shape of Water. and <laughs> well, I think this is going to be a very different type of monster movie. Yeah, this is going to be more Paddington. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paddington 2, if anything, hopefully. Well, no, there, there already is. They need a Paddington 3. 
Yeah, I got. I still need to see those because I've heard they're actually really good. Yeah. yeah well, we're we're getting on a tangent, right? But, uh, right. But because they're not horror, even in the slightest. <laughs> but the Paddington movies, the Paddington movies are great. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're both they're both brilliant. Oh, uh, yeah. What other news we got? We we have more casting news. Um, Amy Simetz, who why don't we just admit that she's a screen queen from Alien Covenant and yeah. You're Next? Mm-hmm. Um, she is. Uh, getting the female lead i'm assuming it's the mother in the pet cemetery remake oh nice so sweet so that'll be that that'll be cool to look forward yeah I, I think we just need to just admit that she's a modern screen queen because she's done other stuff obviously but she's a great actress oh yeah very versatile so that'll be that'll be fun to see and speaking of casting news jamie fox is going to be uh the new spawn todd mcfarland finally got his casting that he's been talking about since Django unchained when he first started taking to social media and saying, I'm making a Spawn movie. Fuck all of you. So, uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> Jamie Foxx is very hit or miss with me. I mean, uh, he was great in Django Unchained, of course. Uh, and then... Baby Driver. Baby Driver, phenomenal. <laughs> but then he also did Amazing Spider-Man 2, which... Oh, God. Uh, surprisingly, in that movie, he was one of the worst parts. Yeesh. But that movie had a lot of going against it, but... He also was awesome and held up. Remember that movie? Um, I, no one, I, I don't never saw that one. No one where he goes to a gas station. His name's Mike Tyson. And, and, never mind. For everyone who who loves held up, please give me a shout out because that's great. <laughs> I swear, I see every movie made, and I haven't seen that one. Oh, Do I need man. to look it up? Is it good? It's it's a '90s comedy, and it's '90s comedy as fuck. But. <laughs> I love how that is now an adjective. It's 90s comedy as fuck. It was a different time. Yeah. I mean, it was him, you know, and uh, I believe uh, Nia Long was in it too. Um, Yeah. Just classic 90s. It's on HBO at 2 a.m. tomorrow. Is it really? Yes. Oh, boy. I better set my alarm. I was going to say, well, I'll set the DVR. I'm not going to set the alarm. (laughs) Uh, For for West Coast, it's on at 5.05 tomorrow morning on hbo which ah, to all, all right. our listeners you're going to be a week behind so sorry you missed out on held up yeah yeah <laughs> check your local listings <laughs> uh what other news we got anything good well i'd also like to mention uh my favorite horror movie just came out uh, ah yes it's a very fascinating book it's uh, a collection of 48 essays but by, uh, by various different people in the horror industry and community uh talking about their favorite horror movie uh and I should add it was uh produced and edited by uh christian ackerman and there are all kinds of people talking about all kinds of favorite horror movies in here like uh too many to list like if we're talking 48 offers and essays um and talking about some of the favorites uh, from everything from uh sewing green and nightmare on elm street halloween godzilla deadly friend uh sleepaway camp 2 unhappy cappers so uh, very Wait, interesting mix somebody at- did deadly friend yes that makes my heart big was it, I, <laughs> was it a comedian it had to be a comedian uh, Let's see. Okay, the the person who chose Deadly Friend as their favorite was. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Uh, I was uh, uh, Blake uh, Regal. I don't know who Blake Regal is. Apologies to Blake Regal for yeah not recognizing but, but your we name. but we love your choice. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, that's the thing. I was at the uh, Dark Delicacies signing in Burbank, and for those who don't know, Dark Delicacies is a uh, genre bookstore in Burbank, and they do a lot of signings and fun events. But it was just it's just always so nice to see the horror community come together like that because like I, I was. It was a huge crowd, uh, which which is cool, though it was very cramped. But uh, it, it, but no, it was very nice to see everybody together like that for the signing and supporting each other, and you know, it's just it's it, moments like that that really uh, uh, that really wore my heart about about the horror community. I think that uh, my friend Miguel Rodriguez did a movie in that book. He has a chapter, I think. He he's the uh, founder of the Horrible Imaginings Film Festival, and he does. I think his podcast is called Monster Island. Podcast. Podcast. But he's a he's a guy down here down here in San Diego where I am from. I'm not sure what movie he did, but I know that he's been uh, letting everybody know that he's. Uh... Well, speaking of uh, Burbank, uh, right next door. I was next door uh, this weekend over at the Bearded Ladies Mystic Museum, uh, nice. where John Casser, <laughs> who famously voiced the Crypt Keeper in Tales from the Crypt TV show, uh, was doing signings and meet and greets. And because um, right now at the Bearded Ladies, they're doing a uh, art installation in, inspired by Tales from the Crypt and Goosebumps. And let me tell you, I have never met someone so humble. Uh, that man was, he talked to everybody 
for a very long time, which made the line go really slow. But you know what? Well worth it. He was such a nice guy. And uh, my God, just being in the other room in line waiting and you just keep hearing that. <laughs> you know, so people when, made him do the laugh. Oh, nice. man. I made him do the laugh so much. It, I was <laughs> when I when I wasn't stuttering and pure uh, starstruck. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll add that to my three people I've ever been starstruck by is him, Summer Glau, and Larry David. But <laughs> yeah, it was just an awesome time. Now, I'd love to see a movie with all three of them together. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> How And he is a very versatile actor. I mean, he's been in almost like, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, a little over 200 um, uh, projects. Uh, he's a great voice actor. Uh, mm-hmm. It was also really funny because they had like, you know, uh, eight by tens out for him to sign. And so you have like all these Crypt Keeper ones. I, I got uh, eight by 10 for Demon Knight signed because I love that movie. It's awesome. Yes. Uh, but they also had a picture from Pocahontas because he voiced the uh, the raccoon, or I should say he made the noises for the raccoon because I don't think the raccoon uh. spoke in that. But it was, an, it was interesting seeing all these like Crypt Keeper photos and then all of a sudden there's Pocahontas with the raccoon on a boat. So. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> what other news we got anything happening i know by the time this posts it'll be today um the halloween trailer jason blum has announced is dropping friday yep so uh the day that this posts on the 8th uh go and see the halloween trailer and we'll discuss it next episode after we see it sure yep. enough yeah the and, hype is real and yeah. <laughs> trust us i horror has has it set so that as soon as it drops yeah. we'll have it live so Keep your eyes and ears out for that, folks. Cause. Yeah, keep refreshing Eye Horror, and you'll be the first to see the uh, yeah. <laughs> new Halloween trailer <laughs> starting at midnight. Lord knows we'll have opinions on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, good. Yeah, brace your, brace yourself for the internet reactions. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. They're coming. Yeah, the internet is a toxic place. So yeah, I'm sure that uh, it'll be polarizing. Oh yeah. Um, do we got any other news, or do we want to move on to to new releases? Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw it was actually right after we recorded our last episode because it's out now. But it's one of my favorite movies of the year. Upgrade. Yes. Ooh. Upgrade is genius. Oh uh, yeah, it I loved is it. So much fun. It um it is. I mean, if you don't know what it's about, it's about basically a guy who gets paralyzed, and they put a computer chip that uh, the science mumbo jumbo of it is. It causes his uh, synapses to reattach, so he can walk as long as his computer chip is is helping him. And um, he basically goes on a revenge mission. But it's funny because like the fight scenes are incredible because mm-hmm. I don't know if they were shot in slow motion and then sped up but the guy when the computer is controlling his body to fight his movements are so fluid it's it's almost like like he's on a rubber band and he's dodging punches and then you know i mean it's it's i would love to see to see a behind the scenes on how they shot those action scenes because i i don't know how he didn't get whiplash or you know hurt himself Mm -hmm. you know he's just so so fluid it's yeah it's it's like one of those toys where you push on the base and part you know that, that that has um elastic bands in it you push in the base and half of it collapses and then the other half you know that's what he reminded me of when he's <laughs> doing his fights so yeah upgrade is i i loved it yeah i just saw it yesterday and yeah like i'm a big fan of uh like cyberpunk stories and uh sci-fi action and uh, there's definitely some horror elements in there but yeah just it's just so cross genre i loved it and it was very interesting because, you know, like, well, it was a Blumhouse movie, or rather Blumhouse Tilt, which I, I yeah, guess Yeah, B.H. Tilt. Right, right. Um, but I'm very happy that they went for it. Um, and Well, it's Lee Whannell wrote and yeah, directed it. it who, yeah, from, yeah. I was, who did Saw and Insidious. So, I mean, it, the, the connection to Blumhouse is there with him anyway. And, you know, he's probably just out, you know, while James Wan's making Aquaman, you know, <laughs> Lee Whannell's, you know killing time making one of the best movies of 2018 and i have to and i have to give lee winnell a lot of credit because he wrote and directed this one uh which uh he he hasn't done since insidious 3 and yeah no he he really made this work uh like it looks better than most big budget sci-fi movies Mm. and Yeah. yeah it's very clever and like i you know like being an avid movie watcher and writer myself, I like to think, you know, I can see stuff coming, but it's just uh, the story really ca- kept me on the edge of my seat. It was just yeah. really intense. It, yeah, it's it is. It's it's incredible. Um, another thing I saw that was total hype train 
and it totally lived up to it. I saw Hereditary. Oh, yes, finally. And, uh, I hate both um, of you. <laughs> oh, my God. It is, you know, and, and the thing is, I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't want to say too much about it because this, don't even watch a trailer. Kriya, have you seen the trailer? Uh, I, I have when it first dropped, okay. and I have been, I swear to God, every time I go to the movie theater, it's hand, like uh, my friends were making fun of me when we went to go see Deadpool, when I went to go see Deadpool 2 a second time. I just had like my hands over my head, and they're like, so stop being dramatic, and I just said, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea how much you, these two guys, you two alone, have been hyping this thing. So uh, Now that I have seen the movie, I went back and watched the trailer, and there's a huge, major spoiler in the trailer, and... The thing that makes the major spoiler stupid in the trailer is it's an audio edit. It's not even something that's in the movie. It's something a character says to something else that is a jaw-dropping spoiler when it happens in the movie. So I'm like, why are you putting this in it yet? Yeah, avoid the trailer. Just go see it because it is it's weird. I I know it's going to be polarizing because it's not like it's not like boo in your face scary. It's 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 a lot like The Witch. It's just mm-hmm. a real slow burn um you know, it's not it's it's and it's pretty are, long are, too. It's over 2 hours long. Yeah. That's another thing. It's it's glacially paced. It is a total slow burn. But I was thinking about this, and every scene is essential. Mm-hmm. You couldn't lose any scenes, but the scenes themselves are long and drawn out. So that's where, I mean, if, if you were going to tighten it, it, it had to be over two hours long. Yeah. If you were going to tighten it up, you could do it within the scenes maybe and pick up the pace. But even that might kill the pace of the thing as a whole. I mean, it is it is over two hours, but it doesn't feel like it. It's, you know, I mean, it is glacially paced, but it keeps your attention the whole time. Time. You know, you're never looking at your watch or, you know, thinking about, you know, your your bag of kettle chips. You know, you're... Yeah. <laughs> one time I did that. The one time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. Yeah. It for me, it lived up to the hype. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. But I know it's going to be polarizing just as the witch was. You know, and I think anything that has that much buzz coming out of its festival run is bound to be polarized. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people, it's not going to be the movie that a lot of people think it is. And I think that the, this year's Exorcist is going to kind of not kill it, but is going to work against it because it's a completely different kind of movie. Yeah, and we talked about this before that there's always one horror movie every year now that gets hyped up and then there, there's a lot of backlash against it. And also they say, oh, it's not horror. But yeah, no, if, ever, but no, this is generally an incredible uh, genre movie and uh, you know I, f- I feel like even regardless of that that this movie is so amazing that uh, it's still going to be a lot uh, it's going to be a favorite for a lot of people this year and yeah it, and it's genuinely scary like genuinely scary yeah it's yeah it I mean it, it but but it's not like a like a screamer scary it's more like like the witch where you just can't relax you know y- you know you you it's more just like an overall feeling of dread. There's a handful of good jump no, there, scares. There's some really, like, I, I equated, uh, again, uh, this isn't a spoiler, but, like, I equated it to, uh, like, some of the some of the stuff they did in The Exorcist 3, you know, like, they, okay. yeah. you know, like that had some good jump scares while also building up the tension. But, yeah, um, yeah but, but the point is, it, it's a scary movie. It's a great movie, and it's out today on Friday, June 5th, so... No, it's th- it's this Friday. June so 8th. So by, by the time you guys hear this... So you would say, Jacob, that it's this year's Exorcist 3. <laughs> <laughs> to go against what everyone says, it's this year's Exorcist. Yeah. No, it's this year's <laughs> Exorcist 3. It's a big difference. <laughs> Another movie that I saw, and I actually saw it a while ago, but I didn't consider it horror, but I see that it's getting a lot of mentions on the horror sites and by horror journalists. First formed hmm. which is um, another uh, a24 movie it's it's Ethan Hawk stars as a priest who he's the pastor of this little tiny church that basically is a tourist attraction now because one of those big mega churches whose pastor is uh, Cedric the entertainer has come and kind of taken over the town but it's like a parent church to it so it's on the surface level it's a friendly kind of a thing but then stuff happens and he has a crisis of faith kind of a thing and it's not really a horror movie but it's got some pretty horrific elements to it and i loved it up until probably the last 10 minutes and it's one of those movies that has kind of a couple of false endings and i think both of the false endings for me would have been better than the actual ending that you know is you know right before the credits and so it's I'm I'm a little conflicted about First Reformed, but it's getting a lot of talk. It's a beautifully shot movie written and directed by Paul Schrader, Taxi Driver, American Gigolo. And I listened to the A24 podcast and Paul Schrader talked about the ending 
And he kind of muddies the water up a little bit, but it helped me come to terms with what he, um, with, with what his vision for the ending was. He actually said as he was going through the ending, he would show it to people. And if they got a certain impression of what happens in the ending, he would recut it to lead them in another direction because he wanted it to be completely a- ambiguous, which is probably why there's kind of three endings. But he, he explained one ending that isn't the actual ending and i think it, that would have been the one you know if, if he if, if he had made if he had made it a little more clear mm-hmm. but anyway that's first reformed um okay i have, have yeah not too many other big new horror releases right now but uh last night i was back at the egyptian because uh they're doing a series on uh new new england based horror movies called new england nightmares and last night they did a double bill of lucio fulci's gates of hell and the house by the cemetery Nice. Uh, I'd never seen the Gates of Hell version of City Living Dead, although I don't I don't think there's too many tangential differences. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, they're both fairly entertaining. And as a uh, Boston native, you know, uh, it's it's just kind of cool seeing horror movies shot shot around Boston. And uh, yeah, and like Fulci definitely had some recurring themes. Like both uh, movies had. Uh, annoying kids with poorly dubbed voices because there was Bob in House by the Cemetery and there was uh, John John in uh, Gates of Hell and uh, and there was also a, another guy named Bob in Gates of Hell but he was like a weird pervert guy and I don't know just uh, th- those movies are so wacky and weird uh, so and yeah it was great, a great crowd movie too um, and of course, like everybody applauded during the big gore scenes, like the uh, famous one in Gates of Hell, where the lady starts bleeding from the eyes and vomits out her intestines, like just roaring applause to that one. <laughs> As it should. Yeah. I saw a, uh, a midnight screening of The Lost Boys this weekend. And can you guess what the biggest crowd reaction was for in The Lost Boys? Oh, I know. I know. The saxophone guy. He, the sax, the sexy sax guy. Yeah. <laughs> he got the biggest audience. <laughs> I still believe. <laughs> I mean, I knew when it when I was going into it, I'm like, oh, sexy sax guy is going to get the funny thing is that he's a real like musician. That's Tina Turner's sax player. Um, And he yeah, he looks like a professional wrestler who (laughs) plays the sax. And, you know, they exploited that for the Lost Boys. Nice. Now, I'm back to my normal self of not really being able to go out and see movies in theaters. Um, I do plan on seeing Hereditary when that comes out, so I'll be able to get my points. But I was able to correct a wrong uh, from earlier this year in that I bought uh, Annihilation as soon as it went to Blu-ray. Ah, yes. Okay. So I finally watched all of it, didn't fall asleep last night, and holy shit, man. Like, that movie is just yeah. all around so good. I mean, everything you guys said about it. Um, I could see why, uh, James, you had some issues with the last half of, or the last quarter or third I want to say like, third act. Yeah, like yeah, third act. Basically, the whole third act. Yeah, because it definitely goes into. Which I disagree. I, I mean, I'm going to have to side with Jacob on that. I did. Um, I could. I can see why one would have issues with it, but overall, I loved it. I mean, oh uh, yeah, the themes of depression, uh, the fact that it's a female led uh, movie. Like mm. almost all the characters are women, except for Oscar Isaac, for like who's in it for like five minutes, <laughs> um, yeah. and. It was incredible, like, the character development, how each one of them was dealing with their own senses of loss um, in different ways, uh, the metaphors for depression that were, like, heavy throughout all of it. It really felt like uh, like 2001, but taking place on Earth with some, like, very heavy, like, Lovecraftian uh, overtones uh, with it, especially the ideas of losing oneself. Uh, both mentally and physically in it and it was really incredible so i would highly recommend it to anyone please go out buy rent show uh studios like paramount that these type of films are worth investing in because that was uh, honestly one of the most original things i've seen uh of recent and it was so close to being dumped to netflix right i've rewatched it like four times since i got it on blu-ray and oh. and also because it's just re- wow. repeating that fucking bear is nightmare incarnate oh, yes holy shit regardless of what i think about the ending that bear scene is absolutely terrifying oh, oh man. my god it's one of the best scenes of the year and one of the and the most terrifying aspect of it we can't talk about because it'll just spoil so much yeah uh, but yeah. the noises it was making was oh, just... Oh, yeah. 
I will say I can this. hear it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, after watching it four times in a row, I would <laughs> imagine. Right? Oh, man. I was watching it, and uh, one of my friends who was watching it with me was, uh, I'll say it, he was stoned, and wasn't really <laughs> paying attention. He was on his phone the whole time, and when that scene came up, he was just like, what the fuck are we watching? What is this? <laughs> and then, like, it ended, and he just goes, all right, that, that was a... Uh, that was one of the most fucked up things I've ever seen. And then he was just like glued to the TV ever since and like couldn't look away. As Stephen Colbert used to say, bears, a.k.a. godless killing machines. <laughs> yes. And that's why I hope that in the next Rampage movie, they have a giant mutant bear. Yes. <laughs> it just, it needs that. Uh, yeah. You hear us new line? Give uh, Rampage 2. Give us a death bear. Yeah. Yeah. A death bear. Hashtag yeah. give us death bear. Rampage 2. <laughs> Has anybody else seen anything anything good or we want to move on? All right, let's move on to our subgenre of the bye week. So what do you got for us, Jacob? All right. Well, as for the subgenre of the bye week, uh, this time I'm going with uh, alien invasion horror, which uh, even though it's uh, kind of into sci-fi territory, like, you know, like it, there's been a lot of, uh, of alien attack movies that like really amp up the gore or like just really go into horror territory uh starting off with uh one of my personal favorites bad taste from the great peter jackson this is yes. uh fr his freshman film and uh i just love how bonkers that movie's is, that movie is and for those who don't know this was peter jackson's first movie he made it over the course of a couple years and uh it is gory as shit and it's about these aliens from outer space that come to earth uh who because they want to make humans into a fast food chain. And so New Zealand sends out the uh, Astral Investigation and Defense Service, or AIDS, to uh, fight off the alien uh, menace with machine guns, machetes, and lots of explosives. Yep. And, yeah, so that's that's definitely one of my faves. And uh, going off of Vinegar Syndrome, I actually got a couple of uh, alien invasion horror movies that kind of go into that territory, too. Uh, let's see, there's Bloodsuckers from Outer Space by uh, Glenn Coburn. This was a um, locally made Texas movie about aliens uh, kind of infecting the local populace of the small Texas town and causing them to be like uh, bloodthirsty ghouls. Uh, though it's it's a horror comedy, so there's a lot of gore and also some social satire. Like, uh, I didn't really know what, uh, what to expect going in, but it it's really grown on me. A lot of amputations and wackiness. Um, also, a very catchy theme song, too. Uh, and another one, Prey, uh, by Norman J. Warren, as uh, a British film. Uh, basically, this alien lands in rural England and kills this couple, and he assumes the form and identity of, of this guy, and then he ends up... Uh, at this uh, house owned by this uh, lesbian couple and it's about him kind of uh, studying them and because he too also wants to uh, make humans into a food source you know hence the whole prey thing is because it seems to be uh we you know if there's anything we're afraid of it's aliens from outer space designed to franchise uh our species the funny thing about prey to me is um when he kind of assumes it's, it's not really his actual form but he he kind of slides into his actual form combined with the human form it just looks like he has cat makeup on like yeah, like he's yeah. from the musical <laughs> cats but yeah, yeah yeah i got a picture here yeah, he, well, yeah. i think they said specifically they wanted him to look like a fox or some yeah, kind of hunting was, dog but yeah, yeah it, it does look a little silly though so it, it looks like rum tum tugger oh my god <laughs> yeah it's it's a yeah, it's a little weird but yeah uh yeah no i mean like it's, it, it was a pretty low budget uh, alien invasion movie too but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's more of a character study. But yeah, it's it's pretty pretty creepy too. It's a nice contained one because for the most part, it's only got three characters. Yeah, I mean, granted, there's the couple that he kills at the beginning, and there's you know others that come Cops. in and out. But yeah, for the most part, it's the alien and the couple. And uh, and it's funny because the the power balance keeps shifting in that movie. Where like there are times when the alien's like the good guy, and you know you're looking at one or both of the women, and you're like, you know, she's kind of you know it's it's weird. It's it's like it's a shifting antagonist in that. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a drama in a lot of ways. Yeah, or melodrama. Yeah, 
my favorite alien invasion movie is uh extro oh uh, god extro <laughs> i still haven't seen that one extro was described at the time which i think it's from maybe 83 84 um it's just after et and the short pitch of it is what if et wasn't friendly and it basically is, you know, it's this kid's dad who comes back and he's kind of not really possessed. He's, yeah, he was he's abducted more, by aliens, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's abducted by aliens. But Extro is the alien. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's a crazy. I don't want to give anything away because it's so wacky, but it's real schlocky. It's a gooey movie. And um, as a film critic, one of my favorite moments is I wrote a column about Extro years ago, years ago. And I actually got an email from the director. Oh. Basically, Harry Bromley Davenport is his name. And he was basically thanking me for writing about his 30-year-old movie. And it's a British movie too, right? Yes, yes. And then he also pointed out something that I picked up on in... There's a scene where the kids, um, all of his toys come to life. And there's something that I picked up on and wrote about. And he said, yeah, a lot of people don't notice that. You know, he's, he's all... In fact, you're, you're the first one who has ever written about noticing that. I'm like, oh, cool. Well... You know, it was, <laughs> I'm glad that I picked up on that. It was, it was just really cool that he took the time out to, A, thank me, and B, congratulate me for <laughs> coming up with something cool. It was it was kind of, uh, I, it, it only increased my affection for the movie, knowing that the guy who made it is so uh, grateful. You know, he's so gracious. He, he was a really cool guy. You know, and he didn't push. He wasn't, I mean, his his email signature did have the name of his new movie, but he wasn't he didn't like push anything on me or anything. Mm. So he, he was seriously just making contact, reaching out to say thanks. It was kind of cool. Yeah. I actually caught that for the first time last year at the new Bev. And yeah, that movie is bonkers just, uh, cause yeah, there's just a lot of other weird stuff that happens that doesn't really kind of make sense, but it, it really adds to the aesthetic. And, uh, also like, I, I gotta give credit to the poster because it's got two it, it doesn't have just one it has two great a- a taglines when tony grows up he's going to be just like daddy and <laughs> some extraterrestrials aren't friendly that's, that's what the it best is one. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. oh my god that's the one what yeah i thought it was what if et wasn't what wasn't friendly yeah because <laughs> it was because it was hot on the heels of et yeah, it was 82 yeah, yeah. A- another thing about extra that when you you always see those um those memes where they'll have like a little gif of something scary that happens and they you know they say oh somebody some hunter stumbled across this one of those of a guy uh it's kind of like a crab walk across the street that that people say oh i saw this in the woods no that's from extra <laughs> <laughs> and you'll know it when if you watch extra and you see the scene you'll be like oh hey that's that internet meme. <laughs> Educate yourself, folks. Watch Extro and <laughs> cite the false air, the false uh, news on YouTube. <laughs> well, I have to say, uh, for myself, alien abduction movies, I mean, God, there's so many that I love. Um, going back to uh, Jacob with Bad Taste, I, early Peter Jackson is some of my favorite films, and Bad Taste is amazing. You can't believe how sad I was when I found a copy on VHS for like 10 bucks. I was like, fuck yes. I haven't seen this movie in forever. Pop it in, and the VH was warped to shit. Like, half of the image was just gone, and what was left was black and white. So I was very upset about that. But I still need to see extra. That's on my list. But I want to give shout-outs to Without Warning. Oh, yeah, yeah. That one's great. Oh, man. The Alien Without Warning, isn't it played by the guy who did The Predator, too? Who played Uh, Predator? Yeah. Oh, it was Jack Palance and Martin Landau. And, yeah, uh, yeah, it was the same dude who played The Predator. Yeah. uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme? No, no, <laughs> no. Different predator. Um, he was he was famously fired from Predator as for yeah. being a uh, for the design. But no, without warning is great because it takes like the alien abduction and alien invasion, um, you know, genre, and it makes a slasher film out of it. And the plot and a lot of what happens in Without Warning is Predator. It's basically Predator before Predator came out with like yeah. maybe a quarter of the budget. And oh, it's Kevin Peter Hall. Kevin Peter Hall yes. was the alien in Without Warning and Predator. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't realize it was the same guy. Damn, same guy. But yeah. uh, he had a, a better costume in Predator though, because <laughs> oh, yes. Without Warning <laughs> alien is basically just a dude in a robe with a big head. Yeah, it's a gray <laughs> alien with like uh, and some he makeup discs. and stuff and stuff to capture people i mean the discs are pretty cool like yeah, they, yeah. like the like that's the thing the alien kills in a very original way like he uses these weird little throwing stars that are like little organic They're starfish alive. and like they yeah. uh stick to you and they bind your skin and they dig their tentacles into you and like infect you with like a poison or something it's yeah, so yeah. gross and creepy 
and Scream Factory put out a really good uh, Blu-ray of it. It was one of their early titles. It's it's a lot yeah. of fun that movie. Like, I, yeah. I, if you're into cheesy stuff and yeah, and you go, man, I like Predator, but I wish it didn't have all these muscle-bound dudes and great one-liners. <laughs> then, you know, and maybe like done on a two thousand dollar budget. Go see. Uh, find a copy of Without Warning. It's a lot of fun. Would you say Without Warning is Predator without the bro? Yeah, without the bromancing. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, great script. Thanks, Shane Black. Yeah, for, I'm with, for I'm helping with that script. But in, and in terms of alien abduction or invasion movies that are really scary, like I have to go to um, Fire in the Sky. Yep. Like, you, you guys see that one? Yeah. When I was a yeah. kid, yeah. Yeah, oh my god, me too. That, that's the thing. Like, I feel, I feel like it uh, really crept into the subconscious of a lot of horror fans because it played on, like, uh, USA or Sci-Fi Channel a lot in the 90s, and it's so scary because... Um, uh, so it's based off this uh, supposed true story about this... Uh, what was it, like, a lumberjack or, like, a construction worker who got abducted by aliens, and his yeah, friends... Yeah, he, he was a logger. Uh, yeah, he was a logger. There was a team of loggers clearing out this one section of... Arizona forest. Yeah, and they and they said they saw a fire in the sky and like the dude was abducted, but then he showed up like uh, a couple weeks later and he was totally traumatized. And th- that's the thing too, like the movie is kind of a procedural and a drama for the most part, and then like he has this traumatic flashback about what happened to him on the alien spaceship, and it is so terrifying and gross and crazy. And the actual scene where he's abducted is pretty terrifying too, because he because he's the one who goes and investigates the ufo and then you know it, it spits him around and sucks him up and shines lights you know while he, and his friends are watching him get you know pu- pushed around so there are two flashbacks in the movie that are actually pretty terrifying and this the whole thing like you said it's like a procedural the sheriff is james garner oh nice. yeah and he yeah. uh and and he's trying to get to the bottom of where this missing person is before he shows up again so he's interviewing because they think that all of his logging buddies killed him. Yeah. He thinks that he's got a murder on his hands, but he doesn't have a body. So when the guy shows up alive, you know, they're like, okay, well, you know, he, he didn't get murdered. <laughs> but, there's a di- but there's a different problem. <laughs> right. But yeah, there are two flashback scenes in Fire in the Sky that are horrifying. One, the actual abduction, and the other is what he went through. You know, the, the uh, th- they're basically doing, like, tests. They're, like, probing him. Yeah, and... It's just and there's so many details though to the scene on the ship and you know just yeah. it blows my mind that you know because uh, I don't I don't think it was a really big budget movie but they really made it work because yeah like he wakes up and like he's in this weird fleshy chamber and then he goes around he's in like zero gravity he goes into another like chamber that supposedly holds another person but it's like a half melted human being and the right. aliens himself are really scary because it, it's like he finds a suit because like the whole thing with like the gray aliens with the big eyes and like gray skin like turns out those are just the suits and then he sees like an actual one it's like a creepy little like I, I don't know just like a, you know like kind of like the aliens from the X-Files like and, and then they do the experiments on him and oh my god it's like I can remember it so vividly because it was so nightmarish well Fire in the Sky it has a, a link to a movie that we've already been talking about a little bit um, Henry Thomas Elliot from E.T. Huh. is one of the loggers. Oh, really? Yep. I don't remember if when they made the movie, if they... Uh, I actually just watched Fire in the Sky yesterday because huh. I knew that you were going to bring it up. So uh-huh. that's why it's so fresh in my... <laughs> You're yeah. like, you have amazing recall of this 1993 movie. <laughs> right. um, but uh, yeah, Henry Thomas is in it. And also... Um, not the guy who gets abducted, but his best friend is... Uh, Robert Patrick. Yeah, from Terminator 2. Yeah, he's he's the Terminator from Terminator 2. Yeah. Fire in the Sky is a good one, which... Fire, that's a good turning point to our uh, to our topic, which we were, were going to talk about, UFO movies, which I think Fire in the Sky is more of a UFO movie than it is an alien invasion, because they don't really invade, they abduct. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to bring up, because broad spectrum, we wanted to talk about UFOs, and UFO movies, um, but really, uh, and as someone from New Hampshire, I can't talk about UFOs without bringing up uh, Barney and Betty Hill. You guys, have you heard their story? Yeah. No, uh, I'm unfamiliar, actually. Yeah, so uh, Barney and Betty Hill, it's the tr- this is well, as true as they say, you know, when it comes to UFOs, aliens in real life, but um, they're actually the first major uh, publicized report of an alien abduction to happen in the United States. Basically, between September 19th and September 20th of 1961, um, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted by aliens. And it happened in my 
home state of New Hampshire. Um, I believe they lived in Portsmouth, and it happened, like, I want to say right outside. I have the wiki up here right now, right outside of Lancaster, which for me is all like, what? This all happened right down, you know, the highway for me. But, yeah, they were um, – Everything that became the trope of alien abductions, they talked about in it. Missing time, being experimented on, seeing bright lights before suddenly uh, being abducted and uh, experimented on. So there's a lot going on with that story. I mean, there also uh, is a lot to be said about it because it was so highly publicized and it was so highly talked about then. That's when, you know, after 1961, you saw that happening a lot. A lot more people coming forward saying that they've been abducted or these reports just happening. And that's also where you got to see by the time the 70s came around, all these great alien abduction movies start to come up. I think a few years ago, they did a documentary called Strange Septembers about that case because I, I seem to remember seeing it. And I think that there was that case and there was a case about a policeman who also uh, had experiences in the same area with it. Um, when I think of alien abduction or UFO movies, the ones that immediately come to mind for me are those... I mean, I I grew up in the 70s, you know, and 80s, but I was I was a kid in the 70s. And I remember, you know, shows like In Search Of and That's Incredible, you know, where there was a real sensationalized aspect to UFOs and as well as like, you know, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. Anything that was unexplained, people were into. There, there were all of these uh, documentaries like, you know, Chariots of the Gods and, you know, Alien Autopsy, you know, those and, and they were documentaries. So, of course, I was like, oh, aliens are real because they wouldn't put it into a documentary if it wasn't, you know. And there's like a whole series, you know, UFOs are real. UFOs, are we alone? UFOs, it has begun. That was a real scary one because mm. it was so definitive. It's like, it has begun. Here they come, you know. So, and all it was was playing to what people wanted to hear at the time. But um, to a five-year-old kid who's, you know, into, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars and, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, man, the aliens are real. You know, I've, right. my, my impressionable mind, I mean, it wasn't really scared of them, but I was fascinated by them. No, of no, I, I, I totally get that, too, because, well, I grew up in the 90s and I feel like there was kind of a new wave of, uh, you know, like uh, interest in unidentified flying objects and aliens and stuff because you know like in the wake of uh, the x-files and everybody thought like the government was was involved in all that kinds of crazy stuff and like there were shows like uh sightings on the sci-fi channel watch that a lot and uh yeah like i don't know just uh, it was pre-internet so just any it's like people be going around with camcorders trying to see if they could catch uh ufos flying in the sky yeah, yeah. oh and also area 51 was a very big topic yeah. in the 90s because everybody Everybody thought like they were uh, holding new aliens there, or, like there was UFO landings there. And, and just bringing up recently, like the, there was this whole declassified report about UFOs that uh, that uh, came out. And uh, I'm I'm just looking up the exact article right now. Um, but yeah, yeah, like the, this one just uh, just came out last week about um, uh, a 2004 incident involving a Tic Tac UFO, which was called that because it was a fast moving white object that resembled one of the mints. And uh, yeah, it was revealed in a report last year by the New York Times and the Washington Post and adding the details that it was apparently rendezvousing with a mysterious object in the ocean off the coast of California. Which is one of the interesting things because a lot of it you see with alien lore or even sci-fi lore, it's for some reason like when you start to talk about like space and everything, even you see scientists go to it, it always comes back to the ocean, you know, which is always weird, which is yeah. what I find interesting mm -hmm. when I see, you know, stuff pop up when it's like, uh, you know, UFO scene and then, as you say, rendezvous over the ocean because both space and the deep depths of the ocean are so so much of a mystery to us. Um, the truth is out there and under there. Well, Atlantis is out there, and that's where the aliens are going, you know, and the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, yeah, so. you got that. Yeah, uh, yeah that's close encounters. I thought the Bermuda Triangle was widely debunked at this yeah, point. Yeah, no, right? I mean, like, yeah, no, it's, it, it, yeah. I'm a child of the 70s, though. I remember when it was scary, you know, and th I mean, there were, there literally were movies where there's like, this plane disappeared, so they yeah. sent these planes <laughs> to look for it, and they disappeared, yeah, and then yeah. this ship disappeared, and I'm like, 
really you know i mean Stop this is also things there <laughs> <laughs> but, the, Stop. but the thing is though uh, like the whole thing with this uh, declassified ufo report what, what makes it interesting is that you know this is acknowledged by the actual american military uh and i feel like if the news cycle wasn't as chaotic as it was this would be a pretty big story because up until this point like there hasn't really been any official government or military uh like notes or responses about ufo sightings but now they're just like yeah we, uh, yeah we saw it here's the footage we don't know so that's i mean if you think about it it's pretty crazy you know like you say in these days of of the internet where every i mean back when i'm talking you know in the 70s i remember there was a big push when close encounters of the third kind came out um there was a uh i think they called themselves the sky watchers there was an organization who um that they were encouraging people to report if they had seen a UFO and they were riding the coattails of close encounters. And of course, you know, you know, me, little six year old me is like, oh, yeah, I saw a UFO. Give me that form. I'll report. You know, I don't know how many other kids, you know, how many other kids were doing false reports just because they loved the movie. You know, I mean, it looked just like that big ship in the movie. Right. That's the one I saw. There's a Millennium <laughs> Falcon in my backyard currently. <laughs> what is up with that? <laughs> But uh, do you guys remember at all? Because uh, Unsolved Mysteries, first of all, oh, I know you yes. guys know yeah, Unsolved yeah, Mysteries. Yeah. First of all, and that's, uh, that's online now, right? Like on Amazon yeah, or something? It, it's on Amazon Prime now. And yeah. they updated the updates, too. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of my, my uh, first of all, the soundtrack is, is going to be released on vinyl suits. So definitely get your Sweet. hands on that if you haven't already pre-ordered that. Um, it looks awesome. But um my favorite episodes of that, because I used to watch it with my family all the time, were the sci-fi, were the alien abduction ones, were the ones that talked about it. And I remember because it was around the time that Men in Black came out that they did a, mm-hmm. uh, an, a segment on the actual Men in Black. And what's really cool is, you know, as a kid, you know, in the, the 90s growing up on the movie, you know, it was a fun movie. Mm. It was a fun time. They, they dabbled yeah. a little bit in government overreach and stuff like that. But the actual story of the Men in Black – and the comics that the movies were based on are terrifying because it's these guys that just show up to just kind of erase any trace of uh, anything alien related. So when people would tell these stories about these guys who would show up in these black suits and there's they have like very little anything that would set them apart visually different, like, you know, identifying marks, you know, uh, that would just come and question them and they would just leave mysteriously, you know, as they showed up is always uh, intrigued the shit out of me especially with the host of Unsolved Mysteries describing it because that man has an amazing voice Robert Stack oh. yeah and uh, speaking of Men in Black it, it, like just uh, I, I gotta mention like a couple of my favorite uh Appear, I don't know appearances of the men in black in pop culture like uh, there was this episode of the X-Files called uh, Jose Chung's From Outer Space where uh, it's kind of like a Rashomon episode where everybody gives kind of different reports about an alien abduction or visitation and uh, they and like this one guy tells uh, Mulder and Scully or I think yeah like he tells Mulder and Scully or Jose Chung uh, that the men in black that visited him looked like Jesse the Body Ventura and Alex Trebek. And they were actually played by Alex Trebek and Jesse the Body Ventura. <laughs> That's amazing. I uh, need to rewatch the X-Files. <laughs> yeah. When the Simpsons, they had a gag about the men in black when um, uh, Bart was trying to get Lisa in trouble. It might have been when he, she was babysitting yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and she, uh, he called and reported a UFO. And the men in black show up. And she goes, he goes, we're calling about the UFO you saw. And Lisa's like, we didn't see any UFOs. And, they, and they're like, that's right. You did didn't <laughs> oh and then he waves to like another guy standing next to him has a syringe it's like yeah now you yeah. don't now you don't have to use that but it's but but for if you actually look into like uh people reporting men in black which was you know predates you know the com- the movies predates the comics predates all of that they all tell the same stories and it's all and it's it's interesting even if you don't believe in ufos or aliens or anything of that nature just the psychosis of it all um is interesting to watch it's like that uh shared memory or something how people can think that sinbad was in a movie about a genie you know where everyone has the same vague details on the mandela effect the mandela effect yeah although it's funny you mentioned that because um the x-files did an entire episode around that and kind of the nature of truth and it, it had a bit of the uh, men in black element to it but uh it's, it's it was a lot to go into uh it was from the new the new season or the last season 
uh, and it was probably one of my favorite episodes from the revival. But yeah, no, there's de- there's definitely something to that, and kind of the sh- shared societal conscious about that, especially in America. I'm still waiting for like a legitimately good uh, movie about the hills because Barney and Betty. There's been a lot of documentaries. I think there was a TV mm-hmm. movie made about them, but it's it's an interesting story and. Um, one of the facts that keeps popping up, uh, especially with the people who are trying to dismiss um, their story, is that it gets kind of racist because they are an interracial couple in the 60s. Um, and so that fact gets used against them a lot, which is really hard, yeah. disheartening. Jeez. Um, yeah. But um, for the most part, they were actually pretty quiet about it. Like they didn't talk about it. Uh, for a few years uh, they spoke about it privately with like their church groups and stuff their abduction and everything so as soon as their story hit like the Boston Globe and it blew up like people kept trying to dismiss it and a lot of the you know debunkers were saying oh it's because they couldn't handle the stress of being an interracial couple in the 60s Jesus sounds insane especially since you know they lived in like a really rural part of uh, New Hampshire I doubt they dealt with many people let alone enough to really uh, not to say that New Hampshire isn't racist let's be honest New England has a very bad racist pro- racism problem mm. um, Jacob knows being from Boston oh but, yeah <laughs> but um, it, it's crazy because it, and every time someone tries to like debunk that they're like no we have a very happy marriage we love each other very much we just you know wanted to tell people our stories and they actually hypnotized them there's recordings of their sessions all of which is uh, like all the documents, you know, the tapes, the notes, everything involving the case is actually in a permanent collection at the University of New Hampshire. So it is that you are able to let go and see all their stuff. But I'd like to see a movie. Maybe, well, you can't call it The Hills. That might get confused with the MTV show. But. <laughs> Where the hills have eyes. <laughs> the abduction you- of the hills. Yeah, it pro- it, yeah, like a haunting in Connecticut, an abduction in New Hampshire. Yeah, I think we're on to something. Let's start writing it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, that's, that's a pretty interesting story. And yeah, I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, if I... Like, I, I don't really remember too many uh, local UFO sightings, although uh, one famous possible alien sighting from Massachusetts that uh, I'd like to bring up uh, was uh, this one called the Dover Demon. Uh, have either you heard of that one? I think I have, actually. Yeah, that that one was uh, pretty neat, and it always came up whenever I looked into, like... Um, like uh, weird urban legends around uh, Massachusetts. So, yeah, it was this uh, alien creature supposedly spotted near Dover between April 21st and April 22nd, 1977. Just, uh, yeah, because the thing that was is that, you know, it looked kind of like a gray alien. It was like a big head, glowing eyes, uh, gray white body. Um, yeah, with tendril like. F- uh, fingers. So yeah, it was first spotted April 21st, 1977 by a teenager named William Bartlett. Uh, but then a nut- some other teenagers started seeing it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. so it was just like one of those weird things where a couple different people saw the same creature over the course of a couple days. So, visiting aliens or who knows? Well, that's the thing. Is it, that's what I was about to say. Is that actually extraterrestrial or is that maybe some kind of a mutant bear kind it's, of a thing? I mean, is it, it or is it something like cryptozoological like you know is is it a uh is it a bigfoot kind of you know right yeah the comparison is there just um yeah i don't know like uh, one one popular theory was that it was an alien the big theory with sasquatch is that he uh lives on another plane <laughs> because well no i i wrote an entire uh paper about sasquatch in college so i uh, am somewhat of an expert on the uh bigfoot and uh, oh didn't realize i was talking to such a prestigious <laughs> expert <laughs> The big theory about him is that um, he's, uh, it it was for an American Indians religions class. So I I actually uh, went through all the different tribes of North America and found similarities between the way they treat Bigfoot and Sasquatch. And the the, the whole thing is, what, what they say is that the reason Bigfoot hunters have such trouble finding him is because he only shows himself to people he wants to. He exists on another plane and he can come into the human plane and say, you know, hey, look at me, I'm Bigfoot. You know, but people who are looking for him never find him because he doesn't want to be seen. He'll pop out for people who, I think, to surprise him because they because there there are some who think that he is a trickster. And the movie that personifies that uh, the best, I would say, of all the Bigfoot movies is Harry and the Hendersons. Um, all jokes, <laughs> no, all, I, I I wanted to bring it up as a joke, but you kept making points that make it too good. But no, throughout the entire movie, what does he do? He does a lot of trickstery stuff, a lot of 
uh, comical things, a bunch Hi, of Jinx. trickster god would. And then at the very end, when they show go into the woods and you see them all kind of pop out, yes, you can say they were camouflaged, but you can also make the argument that they were coming out of their uh, their plane and everything. So yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially when you get into how like a lot of cultures have the trickster gods or trickster like beings and everything. And I think uh, that's really interesting. And it all kind of ties into this overall theory and something that's heavily uh, researched, which is, you know, cultural and uh, mass hysteria, you know, where yeah. different people can see the same thing. It's why you see, you know, like you said, uh, different tribes all have saying, seeing they saw the same thing or how you can have cultures from the Western hemisphere and the Eastern hemisphere talking about seeing dragons, you know, or dragon like creatures. It's uh part of a subconscious or overall uh, trying to understand the world around us. And I think UFOs is a major, major part of that. I mean, um, when I went to um, the Satanic Temple's uh, mass, which was, it was less of a mass and more of like a music concert. Um, one of the first acts they had was a guy who gave a, a lecture about the history of demonically possessed cats, which was, as you can tell by the title, one of the greatest lectures I've ever been to. <laughs> but he told a story about a witch that was burned in, uh, or hung in England who had a cat. And when the witch was killed, the cat shouted obscenities at people, then jumped in the air and flew around and oh, damn. basically just shit on people. And it went on for like a week or two just of this cat flying around shitting on people, and then it flew off. And then... A couple months later, they got reports up in Northern Ireland or Scotland, just, you know, far enough away where it's kind of like, especially in the 17, 16, 1700s, for them to go, this is a bit ridiculous if the story's getting that far. Uh, but they had reports of a cat flying around shitting on people, too. So it's that kind of weird consciousness or even just, you know, you say something to someone and their mind starts to come up with stories. Like if you tell someone, hey, that room is haunted, you know, by this ghost who likes to... Uh, peek out of the shadows you sit in that room like long, long enough staring at that dark corner you're gonna see something you know because your mind starts to rationalize and create things that's the theory behind bloody mary some people see bloody mary yep. because if you stare in a mirror long enough with the lights out when you turn them on you're bound to see something and it, you know getting to your point about how um you know the mass hysteria thing all the abominable snowman is in theory is the Eastern Hemisphere's answer to Bigfoot. It's basically, they say it's the same thing. It's a Sasquatch that just lives in the snow. Right. You know, it, it lives in the Himalayas or, you know, instead of in the evergreen forests of Oregon and Washington, you know, so there there may be something to that. Or they actually exist. Who the fuck are we to say? <laughs> yeah. I actually think that they do exist, honestly. I think that mm. I think that Sasquatches do exist. Well, I was about to say, who are we to uh, say we're just podcasters? But that, but you, James, are actually, you know, a scholar uh, <laughs> in Bigfoot. Not to insult you, I, you said you did a lot of research, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's one of those things uh, that you can't really explain until you have one on a slab somewhere and someone's able yeah. to yeah. actually like research them or something yeah i mean like I, I do think there's definitely a hopeful or hopefully intelligent life somewhere else in the universe or even within the galaxy <laughs> or even to on save us <laughs> hopefully yeah but um yeah and I, I don't know in terms of the whole government conspiracy stuff i'm not exactly sure where i stand but it, it's just i don't know like when i I dr I've driven cross country a few times and it is always, I don't know, like uh, pressuring, just, you know, like driving past all those uh, military uh, installations and outposts near like Area 51, where it's like if you, it, where they're testing like all kinds of crazy weapons and if you get too close, they'll shoot you. So, you know, just who knows what the hell is going out there in the desert. That's above our access level. Yep. Above our pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we uh, got anything else, or we we want to get the hell out of here? I don't know. Uh, uh, the truth is out there yeah. somewhere, <laughs> and we're gonna go find yes. it. Yes, so because <laughs> if we don't find it, we won't know. I don't know. I'm trying to say something cool that uh, didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> the unsolved mysteries of unsolved mysteries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's let's get out of here. Um, our uh, right. our theme song, as always, is DMP Death Metal Pope. Uh, so check them out our artwork is by the lovely and talented Chris Fisher so check him out um, on Twitter you can find me at Cinema Firate and uh, where do you find you guys on Twitter uh, you can find me at Jacob Davison that's at J-A-C-O-B D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore uh, underscore at the end and uh, Jonathan Korea and you can find me on Twitter at Korean Barbecue that's my last name C-O-R-R-E-I-A N-B-B-Q 
Don't forget to uh, follow us on Twitter, but also iHorror is on Instagram as well as Facebook. We have our own Facebook page now, Eye on Horror. Don't forget to like that as we're going to start having uh, contests and uh, random ramblings. And, of course, we'll be posting our episodes on there uh, regularly. And also, if you are on Stardust, uh, don't forget to follow iHorror News. Uh, we post little 30-second uh, reviews on there. Um, we show, And they're pretty quick and fun, quick to the point. Um, and, yeah, basically just keep following us. We, we don't mind stalkers. Yeah. Uh, on that level yeah. on that level at least follow us everywhere you can yeah. <laughs> so. except five feet behind us yeah yeah <laughs> well five feet's better than three <laughs> <laughs> unless you're a sasquatch yes. then i'll talk to you yes any sasquatch li- <laughs> any sasquatch sam squanches bigfoots what huh uh, yetis listening please uh reach out to james he would really like to have a conversation with you <laughs> We'd love to have you on the show yes. and talk yeah. all, talk everything Bigfoot. <laughs> all right. So uh, for me, James J. Edwards. And Jacob Davison. And I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror.